Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm really glad we're all here today. My name is Avril Lee, and I am the uh, MD of Health at the Red Consultancy, but also the chair of the D and I group at the CIPR. Um, I've been working for improving diversity for over 10 years in between working on health programs. So I'm really delighted to welcome everybody today. I've been told we're hoping to have around 180 people join us. Uh, which really shows there is increased interest in the area of diversity and inclusion in our industry. So that's really great. Um, we're here for the next hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I'll be talking to the three speakers I have, who I'm going to introduce shortly. And then we'll have around 15 minutes of questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please put them through the chat function on your screen. And we'll try and touch on those uh, as, at the end of the discussion. Um, you should also be able to see four of us on the screen. We couldn't fit 280 of us on. Uh, but if you have any technical problems that you think might be our end, again, use the chat function and let us know. This is actually the first big event remotely from the CIPR. So it's a first for us. Uh, so we might need your help on the tech. So let us know what, how it works for you. And most importantly, this is a free event because we want as many people as possible, but uh, we'd really appreciate a donation to the Taylor Bennett Foundation. They've been working for way over 10 years now to bring BAME candidates into PR. They're a charity and in all these things, particularly in COVID times, every little bit helps for charities. So if you could give a donation, you'll find their details in the chat stream as well. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but the big key things for uh, my list are talking about the recent report from the CIPR and its findings, race in PR, um, talking about the importance of building inclusive cultures at the heart of all the other changes we are doing, and we need to talk about those changes too, um, and also critically about how do we make that change, how do we deliver this, and we're going to talk about the Blueprint Initiative from Elizabeth uh, and what that covers and how people might engage with it. So those are the sort of top things for me, but there's a lot of other stuff as well. So today I'm joined by three great speakers. Um, they're all going to bring insights and learnings and practical thinking on how we do this. So our first speaker, I guess you're seeing the same way I'm seeing it, but she's my uh, top right, is Elizabeth Bananuka. Uh, she's a PR consultant and a founder of BME PR Pros uh, and Blueprinted, which is a business with a purpose. And in June, she launched the Blueprint Initiative, and it's the first and only diversity kite mark to promote racial diversity in PR and comms. Also joined by Alex Louie, who is bottom right on my screen. Thanks for waving, that helps in case everybody's seen it in a different way. Um, <laughs> Alex is a member of the CIPR's DNI network with me, and she's an in-house and consultant corporate comms and project management expert working at board level. Alex leads projects and services for organizations and groups in social policy areas, including things such as health, social services, community safety and policing, education and local government. So she's gonna help us with that public sector perspective as well. And our third speaker is Julian Obubo, who is the brand strategy director of Manifest London. I think you can guess who Julian is. The only boy uh, uh, at <laughs> London he has worked for eight years. Uh, he heads up the Manifest Diversity and Inclusion Strategies and hosts the, the agency's um, industry podcast, which is called Fresh Meat. And we're going to talk to him particularly about how Manifest has become the first agency to get that kite mark from Blueprint. So that covers all our speakers and hopefully the housekeeping. I'm just checking the time. We hopefully everybody's joined us by now. Um, and so we're going to start with the first question. And I'm going to probably direct this first to you, Elizabeth, and then maybe to some of the others. Um, obviously, the CIPR report came out, race in PR. And I, we've said many times that for people from a BAME background, unfortunately, there's probably no surprises there in terms of what the lived experiences are. Um, we personally didn't pull our punches. We felt that we need to talk about racism and microaggression and not just diversity. Um, and of course, by the time it came back out, it, we were suddenly in a totally different landscape and environment with Black Lives Matters than when we first started working on the report. So, Elizabeth, what was your take from the report? Learnings, no surprises, whatever. What was your thoughts on looking at the findings? Well, I mean, first, first of all, I think kudos to the CIPR for doing the report. I think that's really important to say, um, just because I'm very conscious it was quite a long project. There's a lot of people now doing a lot of knee-jerk reaction stuff. Quick, you know, Black Lives Matters. I've just heard of black people. I think we should do something for them. And there's a lot of that kind of work. Um, <laughs> Julian's like, oh, God, here she goes. Um, so... <laughs> So I, I, I think it, it's important to stress that this is a piece of work that CIPR started before the bandwagon was created. Um, and I think it was important that it needed to be done. I think from my perspective, I, I read parts of the report. I want to be quite honest. I think some of it was quite a difficult read. I think that it's interesting that, that 
some of this stuff when it comes to race and diversity. I, I think it's important that some of our white counterparts understand that sometimes this stuff and being part of it and, and reading it can be really difficult. And for our mental health um, and our self-care, there's sometimes only so much certainly I can read and I can take in. So I read I read parts of it and I got the gist and to me, it was no surprise. Um, as far as I, I'm concerned, when I launched BME PR Pros, I thought some of the experiences I'd had in agencies were very much, or even in PR, were very much my personal experiences. But what happened after um, I launched BME PR Pros is I just kept on getting emails, um, direct messages from people telling stories that just seemed, sounded very similar. I know Asians have been called the P word. I know black people have been called the N word. I, you know, heard some pretty much horrendous stuff. Um, the retention levels are really, really low. Um, the recruitment levels are really low. Um, the fact that we have, you know, we've had long running schemes and this is no shade to the Taylor Bennett. The fact that, you know, Taylor Bennett has existed for so long and yet we, we still don't have enough people in a leadership position. That's problematic to me. And what I think is, 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 uh, really also interesting is that whenever whenever I talk about diversity I it's interesting how people respond on my LinkedIn account or you know to posts I do but because it's dramatically less when I mention racism people do not like that word apparently and it always leads to me getting a lot of unfollows um, and it's interesting what I what I think is interesting is that when I initially suggested maybe, just maybe, there might be something toxic going on, again, I lost a whole load of followers and people thought I was, you know, that shit crazy. Sorry, is it too early to swear? Sorry about that. Um, so we should have had parental advisory t-shirt on. So what, 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 I, what, I, what, I, what I, yeah, parental advisory, you know, panel discussion t-shirt on. But I think what's interesting is that this takes away some of the doubt. I respect that it was very much a qualitative piece of work, but it takes away some of that doubt. And we can stop now trying to pretend that, you know, it's because black people can't write press releases or they can't be creative or they can't provide strategic counsel. We can start having the other conversation and our sector is 92% white because something very toxic has been going on. And actually that homogenous sector has probably allowed for racism, whether it's covert or overt, to also flourish. So that I hope it, um, draws a line in the sand of us stop talking about diversity diversity in this wishy-washy Benetton United Colors kind of way and actually start talking about the barriers to progression that we've put in place. Thanks for that you made a lot of good points then. Alex I'm wondering whether from a public sector perspective I know you've worked in-house and uh, uh, in uh, agency but what's your take from the from your findings from a public sector? sector? Did, did it ring true? Did it just tick every box and when you're personal experience and friends? Well, I think, you know, my hope is always when I when we started to commission the research is that you see some form of progress, you see something that's different from the last time we, you know, we, we, we haven't done anything as comprehensive, but we have, you know, we have data, we have insights, we knew that there was a problem, otherwise we wouldn't exist as a group. Um, and I was hoping to see some form of progress. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I, that's what I wanted. That's why, not expected, but that's what I hoped for. And what I got, I mean, it's really interesting listening to Elizabeth because um, I feel, I feel your passion. <laughs> I, I, I have your passion, but I think I feel also that I've been listening to this for a very, very, very long time. So, you know, I'm, you know, a little bit older, and I've been around. A, a few years. I don't know. I just use a lot of Nivea, girl. You know. <laughs> and I remember, you know, my first walking into my first ever um, public sector like press office in the local authority in East London, and in East London, in I think the second or third most diverse part of the country, and you know, it was an it was uh, there was one uh, Chinese officer. Uh, and the rest were all white. And I went for a job interview. I went for a, a piece of work, um, which I didn't get. But in my interview, I talked a lot about how important it was for us as communicators to be talking to the whole community. And that one of my particular interests was making sure that we were reaching everyone in the community. And I talked a little bit about how I would do that in this role. Didn't get the job, but I did get a call a couple of days later from the people who interviewed me asking me to come back in and write them a report on how to communicate with ethnic minority 
the ethnic minority population. So that's an organ, that's an entire local authority, <laughs> apparently without the wherewithal to work out how they talk to their own community. Uh, and seeing a, basically a black person walking through the door and thinking, okay, they can, they can do that. Let's get them in to do that. So I wrote the report and in fact I did start and that's where my kind of career in public sector kicked off. So I have this kind of, I read the report and I thought this actually is so, it's been so long now that we've been going on about this. What's going to make it change? It made me sad. It made me less angry perhaps I think than Elizabeth sounded, but I guess my anger was was had to be turned into something else. And I think what I've been doing is I have been, I think constantly in the last few weeks, having conversations with colleagues about what about race, about diversity. And I've been asking them. And I watched a, a Channel 4 documentary a couple of days ago uh, about a school that was trying to eradicate racism. And they were they were making the kids have conversations that were making them feel deeply uncomfortable. And I kept thinking, but these are kids. These are the, the group that don't see race. You know, they don't. They just have their mates, and you know, they, we know that they are not indoctrinated. But you know, it all starts to kind of come out of their heads as they get older. And these are kids, and these kids, and, and especially the white kids, just could not talk about race. I mean, they just felt really unable to and it was it was it's a really i mean i recommend you, you catch it but it made me realize how hard it is if you're like you know 55 and been in the same job for 25 years in a council to talk to talk about race so we have to start calling out a lot of the behaviors that we see that we know are unacceptable we don't have to be aggressive and we don't have to be we just have to say you know hey be careful about that you know think about what you're saying take it offline have a have a conversation and i've been doing that so i spoke to somebody and i mentioned uh uh george floyd because we were having a uh, the organization has instituted a a review into racism across the organization and she said who's george floyd now i think i think pre-report i would have let that go because i would have just thought i've got nothing to say to you but i didn't let it go and i said you don't know who george floyd is and she said no who is he so i said but you work in a local authority in a in a part of london with a with a you know really diverse population you know you work in in as a communicator and you don't know who this is now we had a conversation i can't say it was an entirely comfortable conversation but at the end of it actually you know she said god I, you know i really need to make sure I, I pay attention to all this stuff i just don't see how it's relevant so she'd seen stuff on radio tv and tuned out and you, yeah. you have to say to people if you're in the public sector if you're serving the whole community you need to pay attention you need to be aware of what's happening in that community. You need to understand why it's happening. We had a whole conversation about why black life, why, why, you know, what's with the slogan, you know? So <laughs> it's like, you have to have these conversations. You have to talk about it, basically. And I think it made me sad to, to hear about all those experiences, all those lost opportunities for a conversation, all those people who don't know, who don't notice their behaviors. Uh, and 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 the fact that we don't call we don't call them out. We need to call them out yeah. um, because if we leave the silence, you know, no no one no nothing changes and nothing not nothing but you know so little has changed in the last thirty years as far as I'm concerned. You know, we're still the people that talk to the black community. You know, we're not those people. We're people who talk to the whole. You know, we're part of the community, and you can't categorize us in that way it doesn't work and 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 actually it, it's it's you know it's counterproductive completely yeah. you know it really yeah. is no thanks but, i mean you covered a lot there but i think even that whole thing of if you raise diversity suddenly oh it's the black person's job to sort yeah. out the diversity 
was, and that came out in the report as well. That's a characteristic of the public sector. That's how they, yeah, that's where you find the black people, you know, in the equality jobs, you know, yes. in the job, in the roles where they're kind of expected to be, but not in the unexpected jobs, you know, yeah. unexpected yeah. roles. So then accounting. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Julian, what was your take on this? I mean, my next question, we could probably join the two together, was about, you know, the need to build inclusive cultures at the heart of driving this change. I mean, that's something that was in the report, but I don't know, for you, what was the key outcome from the report or the, the feeling afterwards of having read it? Hmm. Um, I think what struck me was the uh, the theme of inclusivity in, in the report. And there's a, there, there was a particular story there about uh, a black woman who, um, was on an account if she was in an agency and um, the client was being racist um, and uh, doubting her work and second guessing her and her her managers in her agency reviewed her work and said this work is good this work is quality so there's no there's no reason but racism on the client's part now what did those managers do they essentially said we are going to take you off the account and we're going to go to your meetings and you know uh we're going to essentially maintain the status quo instead of actually talking to that client and saying you're racist or resigning the, the account they essentially sidelined her um and 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 i think that 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 story was so um emblematic of a lot of of conversations um and situations that black people in, in the industry have and i think it's, it's it was very bold and, and important and necessary for the CIPR to call it race in PR and not diversity in PR, uh, because that, because fundamentally um, there is this fear of using uh, the word racism or the word race, um, and diversity kind of neuters that, and everyone just feels, oh yeah, we can talk about it, and, and you know it's fine and it's you know uh, easy to, to to engage in those discussions, but. Essentially, the issue we have is not just about diversity. The issue we have is there are so many workplace cultures that are toxic. There's so many workplace cultures that allow uh, people to, to thrive. Um, and, I think, and I think that, to me, that, that was the most important thing in, 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 that, in that report. Um, because a lot of people might see that story and think, oh, I, I see nothing wrong in what the managers did, you know? Um, but mm -hmm. that's the issue. <laughs> um, and yeah. I, I think, I, if I recall, if I recall correctly, she eventually left that agency because yeah. how can how can you feel comfortable in a place where you don't feel supported, in a place where you, your managers can say a racist incident occurred, but then you you're punished, you you are you are prevented from from progressing. Yeah. So. A lot, yeah. there's a lot, a lot. That was like an under, underlying theme of the, the piece was how many people left. And um, we talked about retention, not just recruitment. There's no point in driving in amazing BAME talent into an industry that's not going to reward them, progress them, you know, celebrate what they bring. If you know, if that monoculture's there and people uh, people can't get on, so retention for me is so vital. And to that means you know getting the culture right. Um, so uh, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on the culture piece and the inclusive culture? Yeah, I, I, I think what um, Julian said was actually spot on. I'm glad he picked up on, on, on that example as well, because actually what, what, what I think is, is a real challenge is that often it's the, the, the ethnic minority who's the victim of racism in the workplace in a double way. So not only do they have the encounter, but then they're the ones that lose out on the career progression, lose out on, on the opportunities that come afterwards. And you know, I want, just to be clear, I think that the, the thing sometimes we discuss when we discuss ethnic pay gap isn't sometimes given enough colour, if that makes sense, and no pun intended. Um, the thing with the ethnic pay gap is I have friends in my 40s who are black friends who are buying flats. I have my white friends who are buying houses. I have black friends who are going on holiday, on city breaks. I have white friends who are going on sabbaticals in Southeast Asia. And that's because of the increasing inequality of how that gap grows and grows over time. And I see it again and again of people sometimes choosing a quote unquote perceived easier job to get away from from facing situations like the one that Julian has just faced which is a, a real problem so that woman was basically a double victim um, she had to who knows you know leaving the job she loved but also the the racism of the client and I think that's quite problematic I think the other thing that I, that I think is quite interesting in this in this COVID-19 world it's interesting that we're 
Black Lives Matters and George Floyd and the amount of deaths that have happened uh, around Black Asian um, mixed race ethnic minorities during COVID has led a lot of people to now want to do something around diversity. But on the flip side, just in April, May, a lot of people cutting their diversity budgets as COVID kicked. And that's what happens because as soon as they, they, you know, there's this argument that as soon as there's an economic problem, you stop doing something around diversity. As soon as there's an issue, you stop doing something around diversity. And to me, there's no difference in the spectrum of I'll cut the DNI budget because there's an economic crisis, or we'll get rid of this black girl off this account because you know it's much easier than correcting our clients' work. Um, in terms of, of, of retention, I don't even think retention is enough. I think to me, you know, we I had did a, another panel a while ago, and I think someone asked a really good question: What are the four statistics? And to me, the four statistics are really simple. Do you hire people from these backgrounds? Do they stay in your company? Do they progress in your company? Those are the things, because actually retention is not enough. I know one company is really proud to hire 10 black girls. Those 10 black girls have all account execs and they've been in those jobs for several years. Um, so that means nothing. It's whether or not people go up the chain and stay. And those statistics, a bit like Shakira's hips, do not lie. I think I'm the first person to say Shakira in a PR <laughs> event. Um, someone has to verify that and tag me. <laughs> No, it's vital. I mean, the equality pay gap, I mean, you know, that's something that I think we're going to all start looking at now. And exactly that. It's not about counting numbers of heads in the company or the department. It's about, you know, where do we find them? What influence do they have? How have they progressed? And, you know, where do they have a voice? I think, you know, that's and that's what and also to do that, that will then deliver the real change in the long term rather yeah. than all just focusing it yeah. now saying, oh, it's been this year. Um, but I hear you on the times. We need to fund these things. We need to, you know, keep ourselves honest. People can't just pick it up and pick it if they feel the focus moves on. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, Avril, sorry, that was the fourth statistic. You're quite right, is, is what they're paid. That's a really important marker as well, that data. Sorry. Go on, Alex. Sorry. Well, all I was just gonna, going to do really was just endorse everything that Elizabeth has just said. I think in the public sector, one of the other factors is that there's an awful, there's been, it's in a constant state of flux um, uh, in the public sector. So within the NHS in particular, there's been a whole raft of changes. And with every change, there's a reorganization. And what I've noticed just in the sphere of where, where I work in London is a gradual erosion of black comms people in, in the NHS with every reorganization. So every, with every restructure, you know, there's this whole kind of um, approach of, of, you know, looking at the, the jobs, looking at the skill sets, you know, changing things, refocusing and all of that. And in that process of doing that, somehow these, these black staff are being kind of disappeared. It's a really, you know, I, I'll give, I can give one very quick example of a, an, a, a merger that I worked on between two organisations where um, in one organisation there were three uh, black comms people, including the, the head of the team, the manager, and after the reorganisation there were no, no black people. And at several points in that process I questioned the process because I knew where it was heading and I said you know shouldn't we take a care and they said and I actually remember this really well that um, it was their responsibility to be completely fair and if they were being completely fair uh, this was this is what was going to happen these three people would lose their jobs and if they didn't do that then they would be discriminating against the other the other people in the in the pool um, I still to this day don't understand the log logic of that conversation because what I was saying to them was you're about to lose something really important that you have in this in this team and you can't lose it by accident it can't just slip away you can't reorganize and then find yourself in that that's unacceptable but yet it wasn't unacceptable and that's exactly what happened and there are these insidious ways that things as I say you know putting people on the on the on the you know diversity type work, marginalising them by 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 seeing them in such a, a, a 
really to, uh, the public sector is terrible for that it it, compen it puts you in a compartment and you kind of tend to stay there and if you're black the progression is painful it's painful because of you know these misconceptions perceptions i don't know what you call them um but what the other thing the other point i wanted to make is that the public sector is very good at language so it has a very complex and very you know uh, expansive way to talk about diversity and equality and all those things it does an awful lot of talking uh, i've been part of more talking in the public sector about all of this than i care to remember i haven't been part of a lot of action at all uh, and the very and the bits of action for me that work um are doing things like you know having apprentices in your team that you then employ because i see a lot of i see a lot of numbers looking good on paper because if you run an apprenticeship scheme you get a lot of the young black kids in that's great they come in and they go straight out and the graduates i was in i was in another east london local authority recently um uh, there were some lovely young graduates there. I think there were about six or eight of them. And I think I saw, I think one of them was black. Um, you know, to me, it's not, what's going on? What is going on? In the heart of East London, you've got yeah. six graduates, one of them is black. And then, you know, so which means they, they will hire probably two or three of those, will get a permanent job. And, and, and it won't be, the, it won't be, it won't be the black candidates and we have to we have to have we we have to do more to have visible things happening and that is about hiring it is about it is about the same things that Elizabeth was talking about about retention it's also about in public sector development and training so what tends to happen is that you get stuck you know you don't get kind of picked for the team you don't get picked to go on the management training development year-long course you don't you don't get all those all those things don't come to you and you know i'm going to hold my hand up and say it for me working as a contractor is the only way that i can progress i could have progressed that, that's how I see, you know that's how and i see that, it and that came up in the report as well where we talked about people either going independent or freelance with to check out the culture or to get that progression absolutely i'm going to get elizabeth talking about blueprint in a second but i want about one more area before we did that because and i hold my hand up because i'm guilty as well is actually we often talk about the challenges of diversity and inclusion we talk about you know how do we uh, make the difference in the change but we sometimes forget to talk about the benefits and the what i call the diversity dividend that if we got this right actually it would help our work it would help our businesses it would help the bottom line so i didn't know elizabeth if you had any other than doing the right thing whether you thought about you know how do we sell them what the benefits are of of making them yeah. more diverse well, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting, just, just the connection with, with, with Black Lives Matters. And I just want to flag, no way do I think diversifying PR and comms is the same as Black Lives Matters or as important. Let's just be clear. Even I recognise, you know, um, where I am in that hierarchy and where we, we are. All do, we all do what we can do, yeah, right? Also, but, but, but it's interesting. One of, one of the things that, that the, the, you know, Black Lives Matters had, had, its, had its heart, and this is not the, the organisation, the, the movement and the ideology was that, you know, if, if if, if black people are safe we're all safe you know if we benefit we all benefit and it is that thing the, the thing fundamentally about the blueprint is it's you know cutting away um barriers to progression it's getting rid of um systemic uh barriers to equality and if you they are put in place i have no doubt that it will actually be better for other groups that are often victims of, of discrimination, whether that is, you know, I don't know what happens to women over 40 in PR, but I assume they're, 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 they're shipped out of London and left somewhere. Um, oh God knows, they, maybe there's an agency full of women over 40. Um, I don't know what happens to parents as well. I don't know what happens to LGBTQ+, plus, but I certainly feel that, you know, there's a lot of statistics that show that when you go to employment tribunals, a lot of groups that are marginalised in life are also end up being overly represented in employment tribunals. So you get a lot of older people in employment tribunals, people with a disability, um, women with children, people from, um, I guess, um, who maybe haven't gone the, the university route of education, basically the, the, the more, more vulnerable, as we've kind of seen with them 
essential workers that's happened with, 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 with um, COVID. So I firmly believe that with the thing with the blueprint is that it will it will be good for all of us. That, you know, we, we, we know that there are businesses. I mean, I, I know you didn't you didn't ask about the blueprint. I'm just talking about equality in general. But the, the thing the, the thing is, we all know that it, that in talking about PR agencies, you can set up a PR agency with just, um, you know, Wi-Fi and a MacBook and, you know, and you're good to go pretty much. It's probably legally harder and uh, to set up an estate agency. Can you believe that? Than it is to set up a PR agency. And at no point does anyone check you on your values. So you've got a whole load of agencies that have built up with perhaps never a HR person, never a single HR policy. And the problem is the blueprint asks you and suggests you should put those things in place and that's and and just having those things in place will make life easier for everyone that works in a PR agency we don't I mean it's not relevant we're not going to touch on it in this discussion but you know we also know that that women I think are, are treated horrendously in the sector and have for a long time I mean thank god me too has happened but I think yeah. that there's definitely been some situations where I think we've left a lot of vulnerable young women in very challenging situations with clients and journalists and stuff like that wouldn't happen with the blueprint either no, that's Sorry, that's I, I don't no. even know if I answered your question, Avril. I just decided this is the monologue I wanted to commit to. Well, lots of good points. It's, and that's, it's absolutely true. I mean, it, what's good if you can look after the people who are most vulnerable in your society, it's good for everybody, isn't it? Uh, I was talking about diversity dividend. I don't know, uh, Julian, if you want to talk about diversity dividend before we get into the nitty gritty on the blueprint, or whether how you feel it manifests, what difference it makes having a more diverse group. Yeah, I think I, I think one of the fundamental issues is that. I don't think a lot of people in our industry and in, in the wider world necessarily believe um, in the value of diversity. So I think that's the, that, that, that has to be the first hurdle yeah. that needs to be overcome because, and it, it's the reason why that there's uh, been regression uh, as was shown in, in the report, because um, it's one of those things where the minute diversity is talked about, everyone wants to have a conversation about it, everybody wants to learn about yeah. it. Um, but there is a fundamental um, lack of understanding of what it brings and why it's good because it's, it's perfectly possible to have a quote unquote diverse agency, but for your life outside work to not be diverse or to not, you know, value diversity at all. And, and, I, and I think the conversation needs to be brought into why um, as an industry and why our lives and why our nation needs to celebrate and needs to um, understand the benefits of having a diverse culture um, because it ends up just being very it, it, it can end up being very functional and you know just about quotas and about putting people in the right positions uh, but but not actually allowing them to thrive and allowing them to bring their whole selves um, so if if you have a a visually diverse culture but then you're pumping out work that only uh, maintains the societal status quo then nothing is, is, is gained um yeah. so, so, so 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 i think um one of the fundamental things that that needs to, to be done especially in this moment when everyone wants to talk about it and learn about it is understand that this is beyond just the industry it's a societal issue that we really? need to, to yeah yeah but i'll also add that it's a societal issue but because we are agencies because we're organizations we have the power to actually galvanize some of those societal changes. But I don't think, I, I wouldn't want to absolve, um, you know, the government or the society at large to, to essentially say, oh, it's up to companies to solve it for everyone. But because we are companies, because we can organize, um, it's possible to make big changes that then ladder up to um, societal changes. Yeah. Elizabeth, sorry, yeah. you're going to say yeah, I, I, yeah. Now to answer your question, <laughs> which you asked me, and I decided not to. Forgive me, but um, but no, I think I think I think the, the thing that I find difficult about talking about the diversity dividend, which I have to be honest, I kind of hate that phrase, um, but that's okay. I still love you, Avril. Um, <laughs> I, won't, I won't troll you later. Um, so, but 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 the thing I, it, it's it, I find it a frustrating conversation to have, just because you know McKinsey has been talking about the benefits of diversity for twenty odd years, and I just find it really difficult to be 
kind to have to kind of repeat these arguments. You know, on the flip side, there's a whole body of work around PR consultants, you know, deserving to be on the top table, you know, with other directors across a business. And um, when we're talking about specifically in-house roles, well, the difference is a lot of those directors across the other, you know, the business that you might find around a boardroom table probably already know more about us than uh, more than us about diversity. They've already got it. So that to me is, is, is a problem that I find it shocking when I when I meet business owners who want to, you know, run agencies with, you know, offices around the world. They're still trying to work out the purpose of diversity. I just fundamentally don't understand where is there, you know, it, 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 I, it's, it's a strange thing to me. And I think that when, you know, when, when you look at it, the other thing that I'd, I'd, I'd flag is that, that diversity dividends, I get a lot of, have a lot of conversations behind the scenes. And I can tell you that I know agencies who, and well, very big agency, who lost an account. And one of the things the feedbacks they got from the guy in New York was that, well, you didn't get this account, but you know, not because of this, but what we were really shocked, they had a team of 12 and not a single person wasn't white. And mm. what was interesting, the agency boss said to me, they were really alarmed that a white guy from New York said this. And his assumption yeah. had been that, oh, it's only ethnic minorities that care about diversity. You know, but I, I always say to people that one of the most, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of agencies that would love to have Monzo as a client, but look at the work Monzo's done. You know, they're so forward thinking in their publishing of diversity data. They're forward thinking in how they work, how they recruit, the way they treat their staff, the way they treat their, the fact that they are an inclusive bank, have, have recognized different types of customer bases. That is a desirable account for most agencies. And I'll say that you look at them and that's what the business of the future is going to be like. I genuinely think this diversity debate is the best way to differentiate the agency from the past and the agency from the future. I said it a lot, but I really think it's the case. Yeah, and, no, and mm -hmm. final point, if I may, I think when, when a lot of, of agencies look at um, the discussion around a diversity dividend, they say to themselves, well, we've been successful for the last 20 years without being diverse. Um, and so they, they they cannot also see the bottom line argument because they're just like, oh, we're, we're doing what we're doing well enough. We're projected to be, do better and we have an all white staff. So really, I don't really see why I should bring anyone in who's not white um, because that might also, you know, disrupt some of the the uh, the, the, yeah. the better cultures. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it's 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 clear as, uh, as Elizabeth was saying that you know there've been reports and reports and reports on why this is good for the bottom line, but it's hard to convince someone who is doing well and and um, and so just alabaster white and <laughs> they're not yeah. going to change. It's good and enough. You know what? I'm not going to use diversity dividend anymore. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think people just see challenges and difficulties rather than benefits when we have this conversation and the, i've said many times now you know i'm not interested in the business case because i don't have to write a business case to hire a white person so why yeah. are we having discussions about business cases to hire people of color i mean it's just like you know but but you know this can bring so much to our industry in a good way rather than people just seeing it as a challenge and a difficult subject and i think that's that's what we should bear in mind as we go forward uh, and and that, Carry on. Yes, sorry. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, the thing about the recruitment, what really kind of slightly winds me up is that we, we're in a sector that really loves headhunting white men. You know, I want someone to surprise me, headhunt a black woman for once. You know, and I, 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 I see these guys who've literally done nothing but read the news for 30 years and suddenly they're a director of an agency. And no one's yeah. questioned, but hold on, how, how have they got that job? I've worked with one such person and literally the first nine months of his job was him learning what our business did, him learning what <laughs> Was, in learning my policy. I was like, you know what? There's no way a black woman would be given this much privilege. Nine months before you actually start working. Anyway, so that's a takeaway. Stop headhunting white men. Surprise me. Headhunting <laughs> black women. Well, I've noticed, and I and stop doing and stop doing what's been happening recently to me, which is, I since George Floyd, I have been approached by recruiters that I've never heard of. Uh, um, I've suddenly become very popular and I did say to one of them, I did speak to one of them who called me and I said, I'm just wondering why you're calling me now. Um, I've never, I've not come across your agency before. And they said, and they said they were refreshing their database and reaching out and extending and uh, reaching out to more potential candidates. And anyway, we chatted for a bit and then uh, she actually admitted that they were on the hunt for you know, really good black 
candidates they could put in front of. And I said to her, that's really, really interesting because, you know, I've always been black. Um, I wasn't, I didn't just become, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you could have found me 10 years ago on LinkedIn. I was on quite an early adopter of, of LinkedIn. And, you know, I did, I did kind of poke her a little bit about this because, you know, I was just interested, you know, I think Avril, you might remember a few years ago, I was really keen to speak to recruiters and agencies because I, uh, like Julian, I think you have to challenge your client. So if you're, you're a recruiter and you know you've got a good, a, a good uh, potential candidate in front of you for a role and, you know, they are telling you things that actually you know instinctively are not right for, you know so if they're saying that they don't want to they, they won't say blatantly i don't want a particular but there's a there's a code there's a language okay i, I mean you know we all know that people like so, hit the ground running yeah it's your job it's your job to challenge that so you don't employ you know the 50 50 year old white man who doesn't know the business or doesn't know the area but who looks good in a suit and has got um, that word that i absolutely loathe gravitas because i don't really know what that means but i think mm. it does mean a black woman with dodgy hip and um you know differently colored hair i'm pretty sure it doesn't mean that so therefore i'm pretty sure that you know i'm not the kind of person you're looking for at the second you put that, that word into a jd yeah. and to yeah. me that is a microaggression. <laughs> that is a that is a word that says to me, you know, mm. we don't want you. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's, it's this language thing again. And like I say, in the public sector, they're really good at the, saying the right stuff, but not doing the right stuff. Yeah. Elizabeth, yeah. I know in the blueprint you've looked at sort of well, you've looked at everything from recruitment to nurturing talent, commitment, uh, culture, the work. And, and I know on purpose you've made it quite tough. You're proud that it's a tough uh, process. So, and I know you've talked about language and job descriptions, Alex's point and things like that. So talk us through a bit, give people the understanding of what the blueprint is and you know what people should be thinking about, to, how they embrace this and get on with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I guess the, the point of the blueprint is that I started working on it maybe in 2018. Um, we have an incredible um, advisory board of very diverse people. So, hey, you know, we've, we've already produced something amazing. So if you need proof that a diverse group of people can come and do something pretty cool, then the blueprint is it, um, if I can plug it myself. But basically, the, the blueprint is, you know, the first diversity mark specifically aimed at promoting racial diversity. Um, and in, at the moment, it's open to PR and, and comms agencies, whether that is marketing, PR, digital, advertising, etc. Um, the way it works is that, for, so first of all, just to, to, to backstep, the key thing for us is that the target audience for the blueprint is Black, Asian, mixed race, ethnic minority, PR and comms pros. This has to fundamentally work for them. And by working for them, it has to give them an opportunity to get jobs, be able to progress in a job, be able to be nurtured in that job. And it is from work experience to board level. So when you bear in mind that is a starting point, this is the group we are working unashamedly to support. Then the product is actually obviously for agencies working in comms at the moment. So what it gives you is, is a framework. You apply and you, pick, you complete a 40 question application form to show you where you currently are with diversity. Um, and based on whether or not you get 70 to 100 points, you are given ally status. And two great organizations were the first to hit that. And that is Blurred, um, run by Nick Govier, Stuart Lambert, and Katie Soliday. And Infusion Comms um, up in Leeds, run by the brilliant Sarah Hawthorne. So Nick is also brilliant, by the way, just to make sure that's clear. Um, so you, you apply for this, for this, for this status. Um, and then, of course, if you get 101 points to 130 points based on your, your 40 um, questions, you then get full blueprint status, which Manifest London was the first agency to get. And the idea of this is this. You have to get a minimum of 70 points to be able to get any of the statuses. And the reason why is you need to put something in place to already show your commitment to diversity. I can tell you now there's a lot of diversity initiatives that fail because people just think it's about getting someone in. When actually yeah. you may have to fundamentally change something yourself. If, for example, you want to turn around and say, we want to be a family friendly employer and you've never hired a parent before, you may have to change some things about your business. Likewise, if you're turning around and saying you're going to fundamentally change your demographic, you have to address those systemic barriers to progress 
oppression, those barriers to equality. That's why the blueprint is hard. Once you've put some foundations in place, you then sign up to 23 commitments. And you keep those 23 commitments for two years. And what happens is, is that I, as, as a you know, black woman, can apply for a job at your organization. And if I know you've got the blueprint, I know you're going to have two people on the interview panel. I know you're going to give me constructive feedback. I know that when you do a job description, it's going to be clear and it's going to be objective. And you're going to say to me the five things I need to be able to prove to get a job interview with you. Um, I also know that I'll have fair access to work on different campaigns. I know that if need be, I'll be able to get a mentor. I know that I that you've got an inclusive um, HR, um, what's it, social cultures policy. So if I, if I, you know, I'm a practicing Muslim, I know that we've already had a conversation of how you're going to support me when I'm fasting. This is what the blueprint is. It's, it, you then, you know, sign up to these commitments and you're accountable. It means that you're committed to no ethnic pay gap, you're committed to no gender pay gap. And also crucially, it means that a business is putting themselves on par with Monzo. So in other words, every financial year in March, um, Manifest London, Blur, and infusion comms will all publish their diversity data um, and hopefully with all of these things you're creating workplaces where all talent can actually flourish and it will be better for business it will be better for your clients as well um, so yeah that's the blueprint and i like the way you've always acknowledged it's a journey and that people aren't going to be able to your point of having the ally status you're not going to everything is not going to hit that top level straight away Absolutely. and that people over time Absolutely. But and it's also, you know, it's important to me though that, that that people were stretched, you know, to a certain extent. You know, it's it's doing doing what I've had to do for the last five years. You know, I wouldn't be I can tell you now there's a lot of times I just scream in my head. I know people think I'm a loose cannon, but all I can say is if you think I say crazy stuff on Twitter, think about the stuff I choose not to say. So <laughs> everyone's like, God, okay. So um, but no, it's interesting. It's really hard for me when I when I listen to agencies that have spent more money on Shoreditch House membership than they've ever spent on diversity and they still tell to me, oh we don't have the funds for this. You know, we have a whole load of agencies when you know all they have to do is win a small client and they take everyone to New York like and go mad you know I see agencies that spend a fortune at Cannes and still they spent less on diversity initiatives um, and also of course what, what's really interesting having done this for a long time you know I noticed the irony that if I applied for a job for some of these agencies they would never look at my CV but yet do my diversity work I'm always in you know I've got a whole lot of chief execs that suddenly somehow summon me you know as if oh now you're important so you're important for the diversity work but I've never hired you to do PR the irony so to me the, the blueprint is it is is a piece of work it recognizes people that want to go on a journey and it's a tough journey because i don't want agencies are here for june because or july because george floyd died i want people that are going to be here and committed to the journey that are still going to do this I, i'm not interested in 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 um in fair weather allyship it's, it won't it won't help bme careers yeah and Ju julian obviously manifest the first guys to get the kite mark tell us about you know why you did it what you, what you found you know going through the process and uh, others to take uh, yeah, I think the, the most important thing for us was um, the emphasis on accountability um, and the emphasis on measurement and the emphasis on progress um, and, and the fact that this is not just something you get and you can, you know, kick back and say, oh, we've got a stamp and it means we're, we're approved forever. You have to come back in, in, in two years, reapply. So it, 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 keep, it keeps the, the agency super accountable, but also it, it's it. It's really good at signposting for um, individuals who want to actually get into an agency or get into the, into the industry. But um, another thing that I that I that I think um, uh, I really like about about the blue that it only became evident sort of after it was it, it, it was launched and these conversations are happening is other agencies, other PR practitioners, other people outside the field um, are learning about the process and talking a bit more. And I know. You know, sometimes talk is, is, is just talk, but in some of the conversations that I've had, I've actually seen that it's more, it's more numbers based, it's more uh, accountability based, it's actually forward thinking. Um, and Bluebin has has managed to sort of open up that conversation and have sort of clear targets in, in mind. So we're not just you know talking about air. We're actually saying, all right, this is how. You know, as, as manifest, this is how we change things. These are some of the the, the failures we had. These are some of the, the learnings we, 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 we've done. So once the conversation um, timber has, has has shifted, then a lot more change can can happen. So I'm I'm, I'm hopeful. 
Yeah, and, I, and it always goes back to that thing which you always say is you can't measure it, you can't change it. So that's the fundamental what you're talking yeah. about. Now, I've got 10 minutes to go and I've got, I've got another screen here with some questions which cover some of the stuff that we had lined up. I'm probably going to combine a couple actually because um, a couple of things here, you know, I was going to actually ask you guys, you know, the, which I, I mentioned earlier, I don't think Bain people necessarily need to answer, but you're smart people, so I was going to ask you what should white colleagues do? And in fact, one of the questions is, you know, I'm not an employer, um, I'm a freelance white middle class, you know, copywriter and a CIPR trainer. You know, I, I'm worried. I'm just saying the right things, but I'm doing nothing. Elizabeth, you talked about another question about jumping on the bandwagon. You know, how do co companies avoid that? So, what should you know, as an individual watching this now, uh, who's not from a Bain background, what would you like to say to those individuals about how they should address the challenge? And Julian, I'll start with you because I'm um, going to work round. That's a good question. Um... I think, first of all, there's two things. Um, there's change in hearts and minds, but then there's also cha uh, change in systemic barriers. Um, and as an individual, um, you might not, it, it depends on what position you have, you might not necessarily have the individual power to change systemic barriers. But understanding that those systemic barriers exist um, allows you to identify where, where you can be impactful if that situation arises. So I'll, I'll give a, 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 an example. If you are unaware of um, systemic barriers in, in a specific industry, let's say uh, in, in PR, if you sit in a, an interview and a black woman comes for a, a job interview and, and someone in that interview says, oh, she's great, but I don't think she's going to be the right fit. You might not think, or the person saying that might not think to themselves, oh, this is a racist statement. They're, they're, they're going to justify it and say, oh, we work in the industries where our, our clients are old white men in suits. So I, I don't think she's going to be the right fit. So I'm protecting our bottom line by not um, employing her. And they might justify them and say, I do have black friends. And you know, this weekend, I'm going to go and drink beer with my black friends. So this is not a racist thing. Right. But if, if you actually understand how when everyone is making those individual calculations of they're not the right fit, eventually that industry is going to be all white. And, uh, and I think in changing, in, in changing hearts and minds, you have to understand some of these insidious things that, that we sometimes don't call racism. We sometimes use other euphemisms for it. But if you're able to challenge a colleague and say, no, that's, <laughs> that is racist, that is wrong. Um, that's a code word <laughs> for for um, blocking people from 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 um, thriving and coming in, 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 into industries. If your if your um, primary way of socializing in an agency is drinking in a pub, then you, you're going to be surprised if you're not hiring any Muslim candidates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. these things might not might not come with the label of of racism or the label of of diversity but these are some of the insidious subtle ways that the industry just maintains a status quo because everyone is making individual calculations and saying i'm not racist because a racist is a nazi and a racist is a skinhead you know yeah. and they're saying i watch diverse things on netflix i have black friends but you are maintaining the status quo yeah elizabeth yeah. what would you say people could do to help yeah, so, so I, I think one of the, one of the most important things is is is, is start acknowledging that that a sector that's ninety two percent white in a city as with a lot of agencies in a city as diverse as London, uh, where you know London is forty percent um, minority ethnic that term I'm sorry to use it, and so you know for agencies to be ninety percent ninety two percent white and, and large comms teams whether they're public sector or private sector that's not right, and I think that's a really important thing to have as a starting point you know i i spoke at a homeless report event last year and it there was probably 150 people in that room it was in hoban and i was the only black person in that room and that is not right something has gone completely wrong and i also don't understand quite frankly how you get up a tube in london which is so diverse go into a completely white room like you're on the set of get out sorry um i need to be clear no one there was trying to kill me um if you watch get out that makes sense um so it, that's not not right so first of all start calling 
start calling out that kind of stuff. But I also think as a very basic level, I always say this, there's kind of four things that everyone can do as an individual. First of all, give up a seat. Um, it's really important. I know we've all got healthy egos in PR and comms, but when you're asked to do that podcast, when you're asked to do that interview, when you're asked to speak at a workshop, see if there's someone else that can do it. It's something that I, you know, believe in or not, as a middle child, I obviously love attention, but you'll be surprised how many podcast interviews I say no to. And I pass on to others because it's important. Um, I'll, I, I'll be horrified if people think I'm the only, I'm now black woman of PR. Um, second of all, celebrate, celebrate um, um, any great work you see done by, by black, Asian, mixed race, ethnic minority pros. We have not had some of the networks you have had. We have not had some of the, 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 the support that some of you guys have had. You see a great article called, you know, celebrate it, celebrate a win. It's really important. Um, one thing I love from the BME PR pros little community is that's something we do on a regular basis. And you can see the impact, you know, we all celebrate, you're in the power book amazing, you've spoken at this event, event amazing well you know what some of our white allies could do a lot more for that for, with us for that call out stuff stop making it our problem it's really 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 difficult to be the ones that have to get the brunt of racism but also have to be have the responsibility of, of sorting out racism and I want to give you some really hard, simple fact here that, you know, the group that can ha do, do the most to end racism is white people. And the group that has in time, you know, done some of the most offensive racist things is white people. So I want to tell you this. What we need is the really good white people to talk to the really bad white people, because that will impact and make our lives a whole lot better. Recognize your power. So I'd say to good white people, always be aware of that. Whenever you see something racist, you have more power than us to do something about that. Never forget that. And certainly the other thing is learn and continue to learn. Um, as we've seen, you know, um, I hate to say this to you guys, but diversity isn't a stagnant thing. There is no end point. Believe it or not, even I'm learning. Actually, you know what, you've probably heard me speak and realize there's a lot I need to learn. So, but it's important. As we've seen, for example, with, with the trans rights debates, people are not, you know, immovable beasts. Um, socioeconomic factors like Brexit have even changed how racism is. So be prepared to learn, recognize that there is no end point. There is no end point for me, no end point for you. There'll be another point that we are like, this is it, we've got it now. If you recognize those four things, you know, give up a seat, celebrate, call it out and learn, I think we're good. And be a good white person. <laughs> All valid. Now we're running out of time. So Alex, I didn't know if you had a short point you wanted to add to that. I mean, only that I agree with everything. And the only thing I would say is just be honest about your own prejudices. I think I had a conversation with Avril about this. We all have them. We all have them. We have to know what they are, we have to know how they manifest, we have to be aware of them so that we don't let them affect how we deal with people. Be honest about your, your own prejudices and, and I think that's a good start. Great. I don't know if I've got, I'm sorry, we have got lots of questions, but I don't know if we've got time to cover them all. Elizabeth, I know there's been lots of questions about Blueprint. How do people find out more? And, and I know you're not going to say email me because that drives you crazy. So what's the yeah, best absolutely. way? Wants to do yeah, and don't ask me for coffee. Why, why do PR people always want to meet for coffee? Um, anyway, so yes, they go on thisistheblueprint.co.uk. There is, um, what you call it, a whole series of FAQs, which I spent, me and my colleague Olivia, the brilliant Olivia, spent a long time pulling together. You must read it because there are some jokes in there. You'll miss the jokes if you skim read it. Um, if you do read it thoroughly and don't find it funny, then obviously you are not the target audience for the jokes. Um, also, we are running a webinar on the 23rd of July for anyone that wants to apply for the blueprint we're running a quick one hour um, webinar on how to apply so check it out and also just the last thing we're running a series of training courses called on point which is about org organizations that value different types of audiences we've got a great one next week um, about nurturing disabled pr talent i really hope that we don't need disabled lives matter so i want to jump on the disability bandwagon let's um let's jump ahead of the curve this time so i really hope loads of people sign up to that and that's on the website too that's great. And I think actually we've done a bit on disability in the past, but that's one area that we really don't come and that's something we need to look at. And we've run out of time. I think we could have like done double the time because I haven't covered my questions. I haven't covered all the questions that have been emailed in. I'm really sorry, audience. Uh, but I oh, think yeah. hopefully we covered a lot and we covered various bits of your questions. So thank you firstly to all the speakers. You've been absolutely fantastic and you've been really honest and you've been really sharing and also very practical. And I think that was the whole aim. I'm sure you yeah. will get emails anyway and, and tweets to connect with you and everything like that. 
So I want to thank you all. Um, I want to say to anybody who's watching this as a CPR mem CIPR member, think about joining the Diversity and Inclusion Network so we can join up this thing and join up some change and that people want to make a difference. And also just a reminder, you know, Taylor Bennett Foundation could do with any donation you could give them. It, I say it's hard time for charity, so please do give a donation via the contact details in the chat room. And Elizabeth's got our finger up. Yes, Elizabeth. Yes, sorry, I forgot to say that if you're a CIPR member, you get a discount on on-point training as well. Sorry, that's my last plug. So check your you member card. You should be in PR. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> No, I've heard. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for watching. This is recorded as well. So you want to look at it. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. How do I get off? Oh, there we go.